Hi. I'm Robert Jacobs. Uh, I'm going to start off with a story. In uh, 1995, I was a uh, teenager. I should have been in high school, but I dropped out because I was bored. And that gave me a lot of time on my hands. Uh, and I became aware that the city that I live in, Charlottesville, Virginia, was looking uh, to enact a use of curfew. Uh, I was pretty strongly uh, against this. In fact, we got to take the case all the way to the Supreme Court, which I had lost. But um, I wanted to know what the law said now, or you know, now being 1995. What is the current state of uh, when I'm allowed to be out? So to do that, I had to go to the local library. And the local library had, well, like the binder you see there, only about maybe half of the size for the, the city of Charlottesville. Uh, but it was like a beat up three ring binder with like pages that had clearly been torn out, like you know, like little pieces of uh, uh, torn off chunks of paper, like that were left behind after after a page had been pulled out by people. I had no way of knowing what was there, what was missing. I found it very confusing to navigate. And I thought, this is a really, it's a bad system. This should be on on the WWW. Uh, as, we, as we call it then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was not being in school. Uh, I was also, was, I love the past tense. I'm a huge dork. And so I was happy to go at the age of 16 and just go to city council meetings every two weeks. Um, and often I was the only one at the end of the meeting. And they would take public comment at the beginning and the end. So the mayor would be like, does anybody, I'm the only one in the gallery, does anybody have any comment? Because that's the only assumption that they could have on why this kid was still hanging out there. But I just thought it was interesting. So I went to the clerk of court and I said, hey, you don't know me. She was like, yeah, I do. You're the kid who's there all the time. What's your deal? Uh, you don't know me, but um, I thought I could put the laws on the internet. Uh, and she said, okay, I don't know what that means, but sure. Uh, I said, well, where do I get the law? She said, they're in the library. And I said, no, that's not really working. I said, can I get a copy from you? She said, yes, it's $100. That is an impossible sum. There was no way that I was going to have $100. And I told her so. And she said, okay, um, you're going to do what with them again? So I explained it specifically. I could. She said, okay, here's the thing. I'm going to give you a copy and you can never tell anybody, which I didn't until she retired two years ago. I never told this story until she retired. Uh, you can never tell anybody, uh, but just go ahead and take this and uh, and do it. So uh, I also didn't own a computer. I had a, a um, an IBM PS2 Model 30 that came out in 1987 that my parents bought when I was a kid, and I was still using that. It was you know DOS based. Again, I'd like to emphasize that it was um, 1995, but that's that's what I had. So I also didn't own a scanner. So I had to go and, and bump into some page feeding scanners from business owners around downtown, downtown Charlottesville, where I'd hit up one and be like, okay, we can do this for like half an hour. So I'd like feed a bunch of pages in and scan it and get a word file. And it's okay, do you know anybody else? They'd like call some friend that owned another business that might have a page feeding scanner. I'd go down there and use their scanner. So eventually, I got the whole thing scanned in. We got the um, word files converted to HTML. I can't remember how we did that. And put it up on a website where it was I quickly realized immediately out of date. I had absolutely no game plan for how this would be useful. And the only thing worse than not having the laws online is having wrong laws online. That's like actively harmful because it looks useful, but it's actually terrible. So that was my first lesson in how to and how not to put laws on the internet. Uh, well, I never really stopped, uh, and it, this remained an interest of mine. Uh, and so uh, I have been working for uh, off and on evenings and weekends to put the Code of Virginia online. And uh, three years ago, I decided to get serious about it, and I, I launched a website called Virginia to Code, uh, where I wrote a scraper to take the, the SGML that was produced by the state of Virginia for their laws off their website, where God love them, they provide it, and to pop up a website using that data and put an API on it and develop downloads and so on. <laughs> And uh, the Knight Foundation, I applied for funding, and they gave me $165,000 to spend a, a year and change uh, taking that software and turning it into what is now a program called the State Decoded. Uh, so the State Decoded is software that you feed a bulk copy of a code into as XML or JSON, or if you want to, you can write a scrape or something, whatever you need. And uh, in just about 10, 20, 30 minutes, depends on how fast your, your server is, it uses that to create a complete finished website that is beautiful, responsive website, that has uh, an API for those laws, bulk downloads, uh, an individual page is established for every single law where people can post comments, 
Uh, it supports uh, tagging as an internal tagging system to improve search. Uh, it's all backed by the Lucene and Solar search system, which means that uh, there's, there's a great platform for conducting further analysis, uh, particularly natural language processing. It's, it's uh, anybody who wants to do really geeky statistical work on laws, uh, it's ready to go. Uh, this is all free and open source software. Um, so the, the idea behind this, this system is that laws are interesting to make available to people, but I think they're more interesting as a platform for people to do exciting and innovative things with. So I baked a couple of things into this. So one is uh, something that's incredibly crucial to understanding laws is definitions. So imagine a law that says you can't play music downtown uh, late at night on weeknights. Now at first thought, well that makes sense. It actually it tells you nothing unless you know what is night, what is loud, what is music, where is downtown, and which night is a weeknight. And unless you know all of those things, you know nothing about this law. Now where are those defined? Well, for starters, how do you know which of those are defined? Some of those might be defined somewhere in the code. Maybe in that law they define loud music, but downtown could be defined a thousand pages earlier in the book. And the definition of music might have actually been defined elsewhere. Not only do you not know which of those words are defined, you don't even know where to look to find them. So what this software does is it identifies any definition anywhere in the code and build up, builds up a dictionary with a concept of scope as to how broadly a term applies. And when you're reading a law, any word that has a definition, you can pass your mouse over it and you get a little on hover, you get a definition that tells you what it means. And you can click to go see that original definition in context. And all this information is exposed through the API and through bulk downloads. So there's a JSON copy if you want it, or a CSV copy if you want it, of the dictionary for that legal code. Again, all this takes 10, 20 minutes for to, to run the parser and pop up the whole website that does this. So uh, this program is at version 0.8 at this point. Uh, there's not going to be a 0.9. We combined 8 and 9 together. Uh, so up next is the 1.0 release. It's just about production ready. Uh, more folks are using it, and James Craft will be talking about that some next. Uh, but it's, um, it's getting good. Uh, so I think the biggest reason why this is valuable uh, is, yeah, it's that platform for innovation, but um, specifically the, the innovation, the connections that I think are waiting to, to be to happen, I think are worth explaining here because some of y'all can do this in Chicago. Um, there's a, 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 what I think is a tapestry of data to be woven that we're working on here, but we don't have all, all the, the material for yet. So something we're really psyched about in the world of open data uh, to the detriment, I think, of the larger picture. Picture. It's a few types of data. We like to know about campaign finance. We're all really big on campaign finance data. We are who's giving money, who's getting money. We're all really big on um, uh, legislation. We want to know what bills are being introduced by whom and what's passing and what they do and people post comments on them and, and this kind of thing. Uh, and lobbyist records. People are more interested in lobbyist records. Who's who's been paid to lobby for what legislation? But without knowing about without having bulk machine readable data about laws, we can't connect those pieces of data to other pieces of data. So for instance, when a judge issues a, a ruling, that ruling is not on a bill. People might have thought of that, that law as HB1, because that's what it was called when it was on the, the, the ballot as an initiative or, or when it went through the legislature and people were lobbying for it or whatever. But that's not what it's called in the law. Knowing it was called HB1 does you no good. So in order to connect the court decision to that bill, we have to go through laws. And that's why we need machine-readable laws. Other types of data like that, attorney general's opinions and regulations are just two examples of incredibly valuable pieces of information that you have to route through laws. And if you do that, you can end up with some powerful connections. A, a quick example of a feature that I'm just about done with on Virginia Decoded. Uh, I run a website for the Virginia General Assembly just for fun. Uh, it scrapes, that's really said a lot. It scrapes the contents of the Virginia General Assembly's website and pops up a new, much better, more useful website. And I've done it for years and have a good relationship with the General Assembly. Um, one of the things that I do with this site is the General Assembly of Virginia refuses to release video of, of their proceedings. They say it would lead to grandstanding, which is total horseshit because there's plenty of grandstanding already. But, but that, that's what they say. <laughs> So what they will do is they have a closed circuit video system already, so they know what's going, to, uh, going on on the floor of the General Assembly. 
and they burn that live to dvds. so if the session goes long, they have to like swap out dvds and you're missing a few seconds of video and they do this because they want to get excerpts from the video to use in their own campaign commercials that are put on youtube or whatever. you know, grandstanding if you want to call it. but they wouldn't let me have a copy of it. so i have to go with the aclu and we end up getting the video. so i buy all that video through uh, kickstarter. some folks in this room uh, helped support that, that effort last year and i'll have to do it again this year too. Uh, and i read that video and i put it online and I OCR the chirons on the screen that identify the speaker. I use voice pet pitch recognition, facial recognition, and a speech text transcription to index all of that video. Well, because I run the website about legislation and the website about the Virginia General Assembly, I can connect those comments on the floor of the General Assembly to legislation, which I can connect to laws, which I can then connect to even things like court decisions. So the effect of this is that as soon as I pick a video player, which I haven't done yet, and all the rest of the system is there, you can look at a law on Virginia Dakota, and there'll be a video player where you can hit play and see a on-the-fly assembled video of every moment in which there is discussion of the bills that created or amended or proposed to amend that law since 2007 or whenever I started with the video. Now, this is not magic. This is all using existing pretty straightforward open source software that y'all could do in Chicago here just as well. But by providing the information about those laws, it becomes possible to connect all sorts of information in exciting ways that would otherwise be isolated. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a lot more to be done along these lines. And I hope that some of y'all are thinking of, of exciting work to be done once you can get machine readable uh, information about laws. One, one last tidbit about that, something I started working a couple weeks ago that I'm excited about. Uh, I put together a parser, and I'm just building it for Virginia, and it's up to the rest of y'all to make it work elsewhere, that will take the text of bills and use that as a patch to apply against laws so that if a bill is proposed in the legislature, when you're looking at a law, you can see, oh, did you know there's currently a proposal to amend this? Click here to apply that to see how the law would be transformed by that. This isn't perfect, it doesn't work all the time. Like 5% of the time it fails terribly because that's just the messiness of the codification process. A legislature, uh, legislators in particular are guilty of writing changes to laws that have mistakes in them and it's up to the folks who do this for a living to fix those mistakes before it actually makes it into the law. So it, it doesn't make a, you can't think of bills as uh, patches to be used perfectly against code, but they're damn well good enough to give it a try. So that, that's one final uh, mention of what can be done with this and that I think is going to be pretty useful uh, in Virginia and hopefully elsewhere. Uh, Seamus will talk more about the State Decoded. I do want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about uh, another effort. Uh, but my funding for the State Decoded runs out like any second. I haven't dared even check the balance of how much funding is left. I think it's maybe double digit dollars at this point. Uh, but uh, the Knight Foundation has agreed to fund a new effort of mine called the United States Open Data Institute. Uh, the United States Open Data Institute we just announced in, in London about two weeks ago, uh, and it is an effort to replicate uh, the UK Open Data Institute. It was established one year ago by uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, with whom some of you might be familiar, uh, along with a, a couple of other folks, uh, to establish an organization to promote open data standards, good open data practices, and a healthy relationship between government and uh, nonprofit organizations and businesses and, and the sorts of hackers like you're here in the room today. Uh, to improve the state of open data in the UK. Uh, our hypothesis is that something like this could be useful in the US, probably not exactly the same, so they provided a quarter million dollars to test it out for six to nine months, and we'll see what is useful here in the US. Uh, there's three basic things that it's gonna do. The first is, uh, we, we have this theory that we already have the people and the organizations and much of the software and the businesses that we need for a really healthy open data ecosystem in the US. They just don't all know each other about each other. They're not all talking, or they're stuck in silos. So some of the stuff that we've heard about here tonight that tends to be focused on legal data probably applies very nicely to a lot of other realms of data, but we don't do that stuff for a living. And so we don't, we don't know that it can be useful to others, and nor do they come to these meetings to know that it can be useful to them. Uh, so we want to promote the work of many folks in this room, for that matter, organizations, businesses, and government agencies at all level, and connect those who need to know each other so that we can all work together better. Um, silos is an unfair word for me to use. Um, I don't think any of us here are deliberately trying to work within our own worlds. I think a lot of us are just really excited about open data and its benefits to open government and generally to business for that matter. 
but there's so few of us and uh, there's so much to be done that it, there's not a whole lot of time left to go to unrelated conferences to see how your theories about uh, tracking legislation could be applied to hunting regulations. You know, we, don't, we don't do that. So that, that's an important thing of what this organization is going to do. Uh, the second is uh, we're going to assign what we're calling circuit riders to provide hands-on tech and policy assistance to government agencies and organizations. Uh, it's what uh, Max Ogden, uh, who will be, be he's a board member of the organization, is working for it, was described as the Ghostbuster problem. Uh, if you are with a government agency and you want to do some um, some of that open government stuff or some open data work, well, who are you going to call? How are you going to? You have to get like a bid, and you have to get the approval to get a con what contractor. Are you going to get to do? Like, how do you find out how to start? So we'd like to be the starting place where we can say yes. We think what you need to do is important. We're going to send somebody down to your town or your county or your nonprofit for a week to work with you uh, to help you figure out what your data sources are available and how we can get that data released and work towards bigger, more important standards. Uh, and the third thing that we're going to do is actually write some code to, to bridge some of those little air gaps that are inhibiting the flow of data. So uh, an example of this, uh, something that I used to be with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And uh, one of the things that we did there was we found that there were many federal agencies who said, we'd love to provide an API for our data, but we have no idea what that means or how to do that, and it scares us. Uh, we do have these CSV files. How do we make a CSV file into an API? And rather than laughing at them, we wrote a tool called CSV API. It's on GitHub. It's a part of the White House's repository, where uh, all you have to do is, is in the URL, pass the, uh, uh, the URL for a CSV file, and it pops up into an instant API by adjusting the CSV file, turning it into a uh, PHP array, uh, indexes it in APC to store it to make it faster, and then puts a RESTful API using the column headers as if they were JSON key names. That's it. Done. You have an API. It takes less than a second, unless you have a really, really huge data set, in which case it might be several seconds. So there are a lot of tools like this. Are there, there are subtitles that explain what you're saying? <laughs> Magic happens. <laughs> and, and, and I guess that, that's really my point, though, is that there are a lot of people, the sort of people who are in this room, who would say, we'd love to provide an API, but what are you talking about? The idea is that you don't have to know what we're talking about, that it just happens. It's to uh, eliminate that gap between desire to engage in best practices and open data and the ability to actually do it. And it shouldn't take Code for America deciding that they're going to come to your city and help you. God love them for doing that. Not knocking, but there's not enough Code for America to go around. There's too much of this. It's a huge country, and there's a lot of work to be done. So we'd like to identify many of those little gaps where we can say, oh, yes, this is a problem that you have. And we see that a lot of places probably have it. We're going to create an open source project that will take your GIS file format and turn it to, to GeoJSON, you know, whatever, whatever it needs to be done. Um, and that's the sort of hands-on stuff that isn't wildly glamorous to do. You know, you don't build conferences around that. But that's the on-the-ground stuff that it takes to, to actually make open data happen on a governmental organization level. Uh, the goal is to wind up with a healthy, open data, data ecosystem in the US. Uh, and hopefully, in six months, we'll be able to report back as to how well that it's going. Uh, and if it goes well, we'll keep the organization going and, and continue the efforts. And if it's a terrible idea, then we'll stop. But, uh, I think it's probably a pretty good idea. So that's the United States Open Data Institute uh, coming soon to a city near you, I hope. Uh, in fact, there is a Chicago node of the US Open Data Institute that was announced a couple weeks ago, too. Um, the, the Open Data Institute is going with a, a hierarchical model where there's a national or a global organization and a US organization. And Chicago is one of the two places in the country that has their own uh, small iteration of the Open Data Institute to work on uh, making uh, city level data uh, available to contribute to that open data ecosystem, and I sure look forward to working with that. So, that's the Open Data Institute, that's the, the state decoded, and I thank you all.